Hello, my name is Guy Rowlands. I'm a professor of history at the University of St Andrews in Scotland in the United Kingdom. And in this video, this short video, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, Louis XIV's artillery and the arms industries which surrounded it. Now, the big question is, why should we look at the artillery services of early modern European states or even modern European states? There have been lots of institutional histories of various countries' artilleries, but they have had really tended to deal either with, um, you know, to be self-contained regimental histories, or they've been heavily focused on technology, especially weaponry. But a far more holistic view of a state's artillery can reveal a great deal about that society's political, governmental, social, economic, uh, and cultural history, uh, on top of shedding, of course, new light on an artillery services uh, operational history. And in the case of France, the artillery is really a test bed, as far as I'm concerned, for notions of French absolutism in action. And I think it's a very suitable uh, way into this because of the sheer quantity of papers that have survived for this particular arm. No other arm of service of the army under Louis XIV has left such a prodigious legacy of archives. We cannot drill down into the infantry, the cavalry or the dragoons to nearly the same extent. We cannot know nearly as much about the officers or the men of those arms as we can for those of the artillery. The papers of the so-called Corps Royal d'Artillerie have barely been consulted, for in 19th, the 19th century studies basically had an assumption that for all its ongoing problems, the French artillery was integrated into the army under the aegis of the French War Ministry from the 1660s. Except this is an exaggeration which calls into question the whole issue of the development of the state. In this brief chat, I want to use a single object as a gateway to introducing the French artillery under Louis XIV. And here I'd like to show you an image, a slideshow. And I'm gonna begin with the main image itself. Here we have it. An engraving from the War of the Spanish Succession of the Duc du Maine, Grand Master of the Artillery with a rich array of details that you can see in this image that invite us to consider some, if not all aspects of this military domain. And of course, our historiographical concern about the state from the 1670s throughout Europe, it really shifts from the question of just how semi-autonomous the armed forces were to a question of how interlocking, cohesive and well-organized were the various arms of service and armies within the state. So let me turn to various aspects of this image and let me look at a few of these details in turn. First of all, the Duke Domain himself, illegitimate son of Louis XIV, made Grand Master of the Artillery of France at about the age of 24 in 1694. And what he does is really, he's emblematic of just really how this French state is still very much a state in which power is shared between the ministers and the burgeoning ministries and some of the great nobles and royals uh, in the realm. Because historiographically, the French artillery's development in this period is seen very much as the uh, essentially a product of the burgeoning power of the war ministry. But in fact, the war ministry makes things worse in some respects under the Lateliers before 1691. And it's only really from the 1690s that we finally get a Grand Master of the Artillery for the first time since Sully at the beginning of the 17th century, who is very, very hands-on and also a very capable administrator who does a great deal, in fact, to professionalize the artillery in a way that the war ministers had simply not done before. So let me now turn to some aspects uh, of this. Here in one corner of the engraving, you can see lurking behind various figures, the figure of a soldier. And I think this speaks to the whole issue of the fact that this is an artillery service which consists of technical gun operators, specialist workers, such as the man you can see hammering away on the cannon in the background, and especially the assigned soldiers here. But again, we have to think about what this means historiographically because effectively the regiments associated with the artillery have been seen very much as units 
that the war ministry brought under its control and it founded and that basically these regiments uh, are, are a symbol, if you like, of the onward march of the absolutist state. But my researchers have shown and will show when they're eventually published that in fact these units are very, very loosely integrated uh, as a whole and they in fact are subject to all sorts of uh, problems in terms of their service, uh, their subordination to the state uh, and their subordination to the French high command as well as their subordination to the artillery officers themselves. Let me now move on to the whole question of the depots and the physical infrastructure which again are revealed in this engraving in the little extract from the engraving that you can see on the left you can see uh, basically uh, a display case of muskets uh, very similar to the one you can see in the engraving here on the right of the Royal Magazine of Arms. Now what we see of course in the late 17th century is the rise of larger arsenals and the rise of the Royal Arms Magazine and all sorts of depots but the importance here is not just with the buildings the importance also of the men who ran these things must be highlighted. These people either owned their positions as royal officials or they were supply contractors, in some co cases operating on a vast scale in say the production of muskets, as you can see here, very large numbers of them having been produced are now on display. And I think this can help us to see in greater detail than in certain other areas of the state, we can see the relationship between the state and its specialist contractors. So now let's look, we'll move on to the heavier weaponry, which you can see in these pictures here. And again, from our engraving, from our object, you can see the uh, a, a mortar uh, and several cannon, uh, at least one of them uh, on, its, uh, on its gun carriage. And again, this takes us into the world of production of the contractors who produced these, these guns. In this case, industrial contractors who often had fingers in the pies of various other activities, not least the actual casting of bronze statues uh, of the King Louis XIV. And you can see on the right uh, the, some of the uh, the guns at, at bottom right, some models in Les Invalides, the photograph I took myself when there at the museum. And again in Les Invalides in the courtyard, the actual uh, cannon barrels themselves, which are uh, really quite enormous. You can see the human crash barriers next to them to give a sense of the scale. Mass production also takes place, of course, in the world, world of gunpowder. This too is a highly industrialized operation, even if it's very scattered at this time. And it's either run as a monopoly uh, with a very favored contractor, or it's run as an oligopoly, a bunch of financiers, basically venture capitalists, we might say, coming together to supply uh, the gunpowder for the state, both for the army and also for the Navy. And this, of course, as I suggested, is also uh, on a very, very large scale indeed. And in the end, really, it's all designed, of course, to produce firepower in sieges and on the battlefield, what we might think of as the tip of the spear. And there remain all kinds of questions about how effective and adaptable uh, the artillery actually was out in the field uh, and out in the sieges. And again, from our engraving, we can see on the left, very faintly troops moving up the line in a siege next to uh, some artillery uh, pounding away on the fort against the fortress wall. And here from another engraving, uh, you can see slightly more close up what an artillery battery at this time looked like in the 1690s. But really, this raises the very big question indeed of how contemporaries saw the place of the artillery in the state uh, and in the army. And what our engraving does not show are the artillery officers who, in spite of state acknowledgement of their importance and the importance of the heavy weaponry, in fact, well, these officers are treated for the most part worse than their counterparts in other arms of service. And I hope to explain why this might be so under Louis XIV. The horses too, so central for handling the guns, handling the ammunition, hauling them across the battlefield, they too suffer immensely. Uh, and again, so the casualty rates are absolutely astronomical. So ultimately what I'm hoping to do and to encourage others to do is to use the artillery and to use the arms industries of the state as a window into the soul of that country in the age of the standing army. Thank you very much and I hope you have enjoyed uh, this talk. Uh, there will be plenty more in this series.